there was a there was a fella, a pretty typical fella. He was uh, he was in a he was recovering from surgery, just as just as a lot of you might know. When it's a, a little bit more intensive of a surgery, they they recover you in the ICU, and this was this was the case with him. He was he was just recovering a little bit from the anesthesia anyways and he woke he was starting to wake up and he looked over and he saw his wife and he said love you are beautiful and he fell back asleep because he was still recovering and, and from the surgeon's marks and and the wife was just amazed she thought wow my my husband this this long hard man just said something that i haven't heard in years how amazing a little bit later, she uh, or he he came to a little bit more, and and he was as he was eating his first meal, he looked over at his wife and he goes, "You sure are cute." And his wife kind of scolded him and goes, "Well, I was beautiful a little while ago. What happened?" <laughs> well, he said the medicine wore off. So. <laughs> uh, that was a that's a I, I I like that. It's it really illustrates. Um, how perspective really affects our beauty and all the different things that we perceive to be beautiful. It really does. Um, you know, there's uh, one one thing that we use to that affects our beauty is like our, our TV advertisements uh, or the things that we read in the newspaper or the art that we see or the music we listen to. The way we're advertised to and the way media is thrown at us affects what we determine to be beautiful. Um, just like the little story there, the drugs obviously affect, you know, what, whatever type of substance is in your body will affect the way you see beauty. Um, but even deeper, and what I think this scripture is talking about today, is, is our relationships can even, can even affect our beauty. And, I, and, and many of you know this, and, and most of our mothers would have said this as we were growing up, be careful who you hang out with. And if it wasn't, be careful who you hang out with, it was, why are you always hanging out with Billy? He's no good for you, uh, along those lines. And, and we, we look at that, we see the easy illustration there, but I think, I think there's even more in, there's more to that that comes out of this scripture. Um, in verse 39, uh, we, see, we see the man that has been sitting on the side of the road. We don't know why he's sitting on the road, side of the road. We don't know if he was blinded at birth. We don't know if it was a terrible accident. We don't know if he was a soldier that just came home and, and was mistreated because he was blind again, but we know he's begging on the side of the road. I would argue that part of the reason why he's on the side of the road is because everyone around him treated him like that's where he deserved to be. He had an illness, and, and he was a burden. And so people put him in his place, as we see in verse 39. In verse 39 in, in the NRSV, he said, Those who were in front sternly ordered him to be quiet. He probably had heard that a thousand times before. But that's why it's so important to be careful about where we surround ourselves and what perspective we put on our own lives. Had he been around loving, caring friends, do you think he would have been on the side of the road? Do you think he would have even cared whether he was blind or not. It's interesting. I, these are the things I think about when I read, when I read this scripture. And, and, and perspective, as we start to consider perspective, um, I'd like to share with you a little bit about uh, testimonies. Now, many of you know what a testimony is, correct? Or what, when we're in the church, we think about what a testimony is. We think about our coming to Christ stories. Everybody really has one. And whether that's they ended up with Christ or ended up without Christ, that's part of their testimony. Um, one of my favorite websites um, is, is imsecond.com. Go ahead and write that down if you have a, a, a second. I love the website. It's, it's great for anybody. If you're plugged in on the, on the Internet, I encourage you to go there. imsecond.com. It's all testimonies. It's testimonies from people like Mitt Romney or the Duck Dynasty guys. I, I mean, I, they're popular, affluent members 
of our society, and we understand at this site, they break them down to this raw motive state to where we understand why they believe and why they trust in Jesus. And, and there's, there's something that, that I notice within all of these testimonies that, that is just kind of a common underlying theme. Now, a picture, if you will, and I am second video, even if you haven't seen one, there's usually a white sofa recliner type of thing right here, right in the middle. One spotlight hanging from overhead, and every person that goes on there wears some sort of black t-shirt and jeans. That's, that's what they do. That's what they, and so they sit down, they tell their story, there's powerful music behind it, depending on who they are, you know, like the Duck Dynasty guys, they had a little bit of banjo behind them, you know. It was just, that's, that's what they do. But I don't think those are the common underlying things. What is most common, and what I find in every single story that I listen to, and every time I hear one of your stories, is the face down in the dirt moment. For some reason, we all have to fall so far, some of us farther than others, before we turn to Jesus. It's interesting. Um, and I think the ultimate, the ultimate testimony that, that I love to read is, is Job's testimony, the book of Job. Um, it's basically just one big testimony is, is what it is. And, and if, you're, if you're unfamiliar with the story of Job, Job was this nice... He was just a nice guy. Everybody liked Job. Not just because not just because he was rich and had thousands upon thousands of livestock, which was another way of showing that he was rich. He had a nice family. He was a godly man. He went to church. He, he loved God. And so, really, read this. The devil and God were having this conversation one day, and, and God said, well, hey, what do you think of my servant Job? And the devil goes, well, shoot. Anybody that has it that easy could believe in you. And so what does God do? He allows the devil to take those riches away from him, to take his family away from him. Let me be clear, this isn't God taking this away. This is the devil. This is sin at work. But Job falls flat on his face. And everybody in his community sees him fall flat on his face. And then everybody in his community, especially the, the ten wisest, most affluent of his friends, come and convince him to denounce God. And yet he stays strong through the whole thing. And at the end of Job, we hear that Job still is repenting and always seeking for God's favor. And at the end of the chapter, we read that Job was renewed. He was made well, and Job continued to praise God, just like our blind woman today. When I think of beauty, I think of I think of art. I think of I think of poetry. I think of, of stories. I think of music. And so often these these images and these these movies that we see can affect our beauty and how we see them. And so um, this is a I, I heard this poem first from a from an apologeticist called Ravi Zacharias. Um, <coughs> And he's got great thoughts on this and breaks it down. But I thought this is very appropriate for tonight when we're talking about beauty and how God shapes us, using those face down in the dirt moments to make us into his beautiful creation. So listen closely. Um, one other thing, just watch me. There are a lot of hymns. And so sometimes I'm going to refer to him, and other times I'm going to refer to him as us. So watch closely. When God wants to drill a man and thrill a man and skill a man, when God wants to mold a man to play the noblest part, when he yearns with all his heart to create so great and bold a man that all the world shall be amazed, watch his methods, watch his ways. How he ruthlessly perfects whom he royally elects. How he hammers him and hurts him and with mighty blows converts him into trial shapes of clay which only God understands while his tortured heart is crying and he lifts beseeching hands. How he bends but never breaks when his good he undertakes. 
how he uses whom he chooses and which every purpose fuses him by every act induces him to try his splendor out. God knows what he's about. It's a beautiful illustration about life that if you were to imagine a man as an actual marble formation and God is the, the craftsman walking around just with, his, just with his hammer and his chisel chipping away until he finds his perfect creation in each and every one of us. The, the other beautiful illustration of, of shaping art is, is blowing glass. How many of you guys have seen blown glass? It's, it's really a neat thing. And if you haven't, look it up. Go, it's best live because you can't fully appreciate it until you see that molten glass come out of the fiery furnace. Because as many of you know, the way they start to make this glass, they have these just shards basically laying in a bowl. And the craftsman takes little bits of these shards and sticks them into a furnace, a fiery furnace reaching over 2,500 degrees to melt it down to its molten state. And as, he, as it keeps that heat, he start, it makes it able for him to start forming him and start shaping him into the beautiful piece of glass that we'd like to be. By the end, he's been, the glass has been in and out of the furnace so many times that it's taken on a new color. And as it cools on the marble surface, we see the artist's beautiful creation. God's beauty is, requires perspective. It requires us to step back. Sometimes we don't see the finished product. Sometimes we see the fiery furnace and we think there's no way God's going to use this. But it's interesting, every time we see one of these face down in the dirt moments, when we trust Jesus and cry out for him just as the man did, we start to understand that God is bringing glory back to himself through that pain. The blind man on the road to Jerusalem had lost his sight. Again, we don't know where he was at exactly, but I, I'd, like to, I'd like to believe that when he was an old man and, and thinking back on that moment, he, uh, he had kind of that bittersweet taste in his mouth because he remembered the pain and the struggle of what it was like to be blind, but then he continues to appreciate and love the beauty of restored sight that Christ had given him. And so tonight, there, there's, I, I'd like to share with you a little song. I mean, they did hire me to do music around here, so. Um, I really encourage you to listen to the lyrics. It's, it's by a group um, called Gunger, out of, out of Colorado, actually. And they, I think they really capture this bittersweet beauty that we have. Oh 
So oftentimes we struggle with the pain. Whether it's the physical pain of a cancer or, or a true physical illness or the emotional pain of broken relationships. God, you're using them to shape us into the person you want us to be. And so God, we're sorry for all the ways that we mess up. And God, help us to avoid that sin and glorify you greater with every moment and every day. We love you so much. And it's in your Son's holy and blessed name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Um, our, uh, as, we, as we move into a time for communion tonight, I, I just wanted to, to finish up on on the most beautiful story ever told. Because that's what this is all about. You see, Jesus was on the way to Jerusalem. And we might overlook that passage, but we understand, if we put this into the context of Luke, this was the week before he was crucified. This was the trip to Jerusalem. This was not just to visit friends. This was not just to... You know, teach the Pharisees and, and call them idiots one last time. This was the trip. The final beautiful act to conquer death. And so, tonight as we, as we participate in communion, I just, I, I want you to think about that. that. Jesus knew as he was healing this blind guy that this would be one of his last miracles one of his last healing miracles where he would lay his hands on somebody, but he would soon be doing the greatest miracle of all, and that's giving us a chance to redeem and get up from that face down in the dirt moment. There's beauty in that, and I hope tonight that you can be reminded that, of that and accept Christ's forgiveness to say, you are a beautiful creation through Christ.